Thought Leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Today's episode is our audio companion to PwC's publication, Worldwide Impact of CSRD. Are you ready? This recording was updated on October 18th, 2023 to incorporate recent updates, including providing additional information on available exemptions. For the latest information and resources on this and other sustainability topics, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform and also catch our upcoming quarterly sustainability webcast on November 9th with the replay airing on November 16th. Links to register for the webcast are included within the show notes, or you can head on over to viewpoint.pwc.com. And on that note, all resources referenced throughout the podcast, including publications and guidance from non-PwC parties, are linked in the print publication at viewpoint.pwc.com. With that, let's get started. The transformation of ESG reporting accelerated in 2022 with the release of major proposals in the European Union, EU, and the United States, U.S., as well as globally by the International Sustainability Standards Board, ISSB. Although all of these proposals have the potential to impact multinational companies, the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, perhaps requires the most immediate attention. Even as companies wait for the SEC proposal to be finalized and to see whether jurisdictions in which they operate will adopt the final IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards. The final reporting directive was published in December 2022, setting forth sustainability reporting requirements that are expected to affect companies worldwide. The Related Sector Agnostic Reporting Standards, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, ESRS, were adopted by the European Commission in July 2023, providing further visibility into the extent of the required reporting. The scope of companies directly impacted by the new requirements is expansive, including U.S. and other non-EU headquartered companies. Determining whether the scope of the CSRD captures a company or one or more subsidiaries, however, has some complexity and merits priority focus by companies operating in the EU. And even once the scope determination is complete, the standards required and the effective date differ depending on the particular circumstances. What's clear, though, is that reporting will begin as early as fiscal year 2024 for some companies, and the reporting requirements are extensive. Companies that fail to appreciate the impact of the new requirements will find themselves scrambling to comply. Further, although this may appear to be just a compliance exercise, It's also an opportunity for forward-thinking companies to share their sustainability stories with investors and other stakeholders. We'll cover key dates related to reporting under the CSRD throughout this audio. In addition, refer to the print publication for a visual depiction of the timeline. Past, present, and future of EU sustainability reporting. On June 22, 2022, Mayred McGuinness, European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability, and Capital Markets Union said, quote, Sustainability reporting will now be on an equal footing with financial reporting. The CSRD will help drive the transition to a sustainable economic system built on innovation and investment opportunities, end quote. The CSRD was driven, in part, by the European Green Deal, a December 2019 European Commission package of policy initiatives designed to achieve climate neutrality by 2050 and protect Europe's natural habitat. 
The CSRD goes well beyond the EU's current non-financial reporting directive, NFRD, which has imposed requirements on certain companies to disclose some environmental and social impacts since 2017. By design, the CSRD intends to drive changes in company behavior and bring sustainability reporting on par with financial reporting over time by mandating extensive disclosures about environmental, social, and governance topics. The CSRD went into effect on January 5, 2023, and EU member states will have until early July 2024, 18 months from the effective date, to incorporate its provisions into national law. The directive sets forth the baseline, thus, Member states may add provisions during this period, but cannot eliminate any of the requirements in the CSRD. The CSRD does, however, allow for EU member states to make several elections during the transposition process. For example, language requirements for reporting, expansion of assurance providers beyond the statutory auditor. Status Update A number of EU member states have started to transpose the CSRD into national law. For example, public consultations have been held in a number of countries to seek input from stakeholders, and drafts of the legislation have been made available or will be released in the coming months. The extent of any changes that may occur during the transposition process, however, is still unclear. Companies should monitor developments in those EU member states where they have subsidiaries. The CSRD will require comprehensive and granular disclosures covering the entire spectrum of sustainability topics. For example, climate change, biodiversity and ecosystems, working conditions, human rights, and business ethics. These disclosure requirements are detailed in the ESRS that were initially drafted by the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, EFRAG, which has historically advised the European Commission on the endorsement of IFRS accounting standards. In November 2022, EFRAG submitted the first set of draft standards to the European Commission for review. Following an extensive consultation process, and an additional public feedback period on revised draft standards it issued on June 9, 2023, the European Commission adopted final standards on July 31, 2023. While the European Commission indicated in an explanatory memorandum linked in the print publication that the draft ESRS submitted by EFRAG, quote, broadly meet the mandate of the CSRD and would achieve the intended policy goals in the context of the European Green Deal, end quote. It also made certain changes, quote, with the specific aim of ensuring proportionality and facilitating the correct application of the standards, end quote. The standards will now face scrutiny from the European Parliament and Council of the European Union for two months with a possible two-month extension, before going into effect. The ESRS are not subject to separate transposition into law by the EU member states. They will become law shortly after the scrutiny period ends when they're published in the official journal of the European Union. The following pages summarize the key requirements of the CSRD that are applicable to non-EU headquartered companies and answer questions that are top of mind as companies assess the CSRD's scope, timing, and reporting requirements. Scope and Timing The scope provisions of the CSRD are broad and are intended to apply to many companies operating in the EU, estimated to be nearly 50,000 in total, according to the European Commission. Further, Even companies without direct reporting obligations under the CSRD may be asked for information by customers, suppliers, investors, or lenders because of the requirements for entities in scope to disclose information about their value chain or 
because they are subsidiaries of EU companies with reporting obligations. Countries in scope. There are currently 27 countries in the European Union, all of which will adopt the CSRD. Three additional countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway, are part of the European Economic Area, EEA, which is a single market that allows for free movement of goods and people between the participating countries. These countries will also adopt the directive in accordance with the timeline set forth in the CSRD. Scope Requirements A company will need to consider applicability at multiple levels within its organization to ensure all reporting obligations are identified. Penalties for non-compliance will be determined by each EU member state and may include fines. Analyzing its legal entity structure against each of the criteria for reporting may help a non-EU company identify all entities within the organization that would be required to report, as well as the timing of first-time reporting. The scope of the directive extends to all companies with securities listed on an EU regulated market, with limited exceptions, quote, large, as defined EU companies that are not listed, EU companies that are a parent of a, quote, large group, as defined and not listed, and finally, there's an additional requirement for non-EU headquartered companies to report at a global consolidated level. The analysis to assess whether companies in the scope of the CSRD and the level at which it would be required to report may be complex and should consider input from a company's legal counsel. This complexity may be compounded by differences, if any, that arise as a result of changes made when EU member states transpose the CSRD into national law. General considerations on scoping, however, are highlighted as follows. First, all companies with securities listed on an EU regulated market. Reporting will be required for entities with debt or equity securities listed on an EU regulated market, regardless of whether they are an EU entity or a non-EU entity, broadly referred to as, quote, issuers. A critical distinction in determining whether a company is in the scope of this requirement is whether its securities are listed on an EU regulated market as defined as certain EU stock exchanges, such as the Frankfurt Stock Exchange and Euronext Dublin, include both EU regulated and self-regulated segments. Only those companies with listings on EU regulated markets are within the scope of this requirement. There are limited exceptions to the listed company reporting requirements. For example, Issuers that are micro-undertakings are not in scope. Next, quote, large, as defined, EU companies that are not listed. An EU entity, including an EU subsidiary of a non-EU headquarter company, will be required to report if it is a large undertaking, defined as exceeding at least two of the following three metrics on two consecutive annual balance sheet dates. Total assets of 20 million euro, about 21 million US dollars as of September 30, 2023. Net turnover revenue of 40 million euro, about 42 million US dollars as of September 30th, 2023. Average of 250 employees. An undertaking refers to specific types of companies in the EU which are mainly those with limited liability. Next, EU companies that are a parent of a, quote, large group as defined and not listed. Consolidated reporting will be required for an EU entity, including an EU holding company or EU intermediate entity, if it is a, quote, parent undertaking of a large group, end quote, defined as a group consisting of parent and subsidiary entities that, on a consolidated basis, exceed at least two of the following three metrics on two consecutive annual balance sheet dates. Total assets of €20 million, euro, 
about 21 million U.S. dollars as of September 30, 2023. Net turnover revenue of 40 million euro, about 42 million U.S. dollars as of September 30th, 2023. Average of 250 employees. The subsidiary entities considered in the calculation would include all subsidiaries of the EU parent even those established outside the EU. This may be particularly relevant for EU holding companies established for tax purposes that may not have their own operations. Note that an EU holding company or EU intermediate entity that meets the definition of a, quote, large undertaking on both a standalone and consolidated basis would only be required to provide consolidated reporting. Once a company qualifies under any of the size thresholds, it will continue to be subject to the requirements unless it falls below the thresholds for two consecutive years. Possible Adjustment to the Size Thresholds The European Commission initiated a public feedback period, which closed October 6, 2023, for a delegated act that would increase the asset and net turnover revenue thresholds under the accounting directive by 25% to account for inflation. This means that thresholds for total assets and net turnover revenue would increase to 25 million euro and 50 million euro, respectively, for an entity or group to be, quote, large. The size thresholds have not been modified since 2013, and if adopted, This would result in fewer companies in scope of the CSRD. Reporting Exemptions Although each EU subsidiary that is in scope has a separate reporting obligation by default, there are exceptions to the reporting requirement if certain conditions are met. An EU subsidiary or a subgroup may be able to satisfy its own sustainability reporting requirements if it's included in the CSRD reporting of an EU or non-EU parent, referred to as the subsidiary exemption. The requirements vary depending on whether the parent reporting is an EU or non-EU entity. Subsidiary exemption, EU parent. An in-scope EU subsidiary or subgroup will be exempt from its own ESRS reporting if it's included in the consolidated management report of an EU parent including a holding company or intermediate entity that, one, is prepared in accordance with ESRS, and two, includes all subsidiaries of the EU parent, that is, the full consolidated group, including subsidiaries located outside the EU. Subsidiary exemption for a non-EU parent. An in-scope EU subsidiary or subgroup will be exempt from its own ESRS reporting if it's included in the Consolidated Sustainability Report of a non-EU parent, whether an intermediate holding company or the global ultimate parent that, one, is prepared in accordance with ESRS or in a manner deemed equivalent to those standards by the European Commission, and two, includes all subsidiaries of the parent, that is, the full consolidated group, including non-EU subsidiaries. Note that no equivalent standards have been identified to date. Further, a non-EU parent may provide the reporting in a consolidated sustainability report. A management report is not required, as further discussed later in the podcast. Artificial Consolidation In addition, a special variant of the subsidiary exemption is temporarily available for EU subsidiaries or subgroups in the scope of CSRD with a non-EU parent company. Until 2030, companies can prepare consolidated sustainability reporting using, quote, artificial consolidation, that is, a CSRD report combining the information of all EU subsidiaries in scope, similar to combined financial statements. This combined report would exempt included entities from reporting separately. This report must be prepared in accordance with ESRS, and the EU subsidiary that prepares and publishes the report must be one of the subsidiaries that generated the highest turnover, revenue, in at least one of the preceding five years. Exemption Availability 
These exemptions, however, are not available to all entities. There are two primary scenarios when a reporting entity would not qualify to apply an exemption as follows. Large and listed entity. An entity that meets the following criteria is not eligible for any reporting exemptions and must report separately. One, it is an issuer. That is, it has debt or equity securities listed on an EU regulated market. And two, meets the size thresholds to be, quote, large or country level requirements. Further, as part of the CSRD transposition process, a country may decide to limit the availability of reporting exemptions and require country or entity-level reporting on a standalone basis for all companies located there. Companies should continue to monitor the transposition process for country-specific requirements. Given differences in the scope of the information required for standalone reporting, or for preparation of a consolidated report. We recommend companies carefully assess the required level of effort before pursuing these exemption possibilities. In addition, companies should monitor the process as the member states transpose the CSRD into national law to ensure that process does not impact the available exemptions. Even if a reporting exemption is used, the EU subsidiary would still need to maintain a list of and monitor its reporting obligations. That said, the questions and answers on the adoption of European Sustainability Reporting Standards, published by the European Commission on July 31, 2023, included the following quote. The Commission has worked to ensure a very high level of alignment between ESRS and the standards of the International Sustainability Standards Board, ISSB, and the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI. The very high degree of alignment between ESRS and the two ISSB standards aim to prevent that companies required to report in accordance with ESRS and that wish to also comply with ISSB standards would have to report separately under ISSB standards. Question. What reporting is required if an EU subsidiary subject to CSRD applies one of the reporting exemptions? Answer. In order to qualify for a reporting exemption, the EU subsidiary in scope of reporting is required to include certain information in its management report, including the following. 1. Reference to the fact that it is exempt from the sustainability reporting obligations. Second, the name and registered office of its parent entity that reports the consolidated sustainability information. And third, a link to the website with the exempting consolidated management report or consolidated sustainability report and the related assurance opinion. Next question, what reporting frameworks or standards would be considered, quote, equivalent to the European Sustainability Reporting Standards? Answer. The CSRD states that it may be possible to satisfy its reporting requirements using information submitted under another reporting regime if the European Commission determines that the disclosures are prepared, quote, in a manner equivalent to, end quote, ESRS, according to Directive EU 2022 backslash 2464, paragraph 25. To date, the European Commission has not made any equivalency determinations, and it's unclear how long that process may take. Further, given certain differences in scope and key concepts, such as materiality, among other existing or proposed disclosure frameworks, it remains to be seen whether the European Commission will identify any other frameworks as equivalent. At this time, Companies expecting to be in scope of the CSRD would be well served to assume they will need to prepare the full disclosures required by ESRS. Next question. Would combined or consolidated sustainability reporting need to include specific information on individual subsidiaries or subgroups? Answer. Potentially. If there are, quote, significant differences, end quote, between the risks and impacts of the group, 
and one or more of its subsidiaries, sufficient information would need to be provided for a reader to understand the specific risks and impacts. According to draft ESRS 1, General Requirements, paragraph 106, page 20. Determining what would be considered a significant difference will require judgment and should include considerations of facts and circumstances, such as the sectors and geographies in which the subsidiary operates, also according to draft ESRS 1, page 20. Certain standards, such as ESRS S1, own workforce, also require information to be disaggregated. For example, total number of employees by gender and by country in certain circumstances. Further, EU member states may require country-level detail for some disclosures, although the exact requirements will not be known until the completion of the transposition process. Question. What if the EU holding company or intermediate entity does not prepare consolidated financial statements? Answer. EU holding companies or intermediate entities may benefit from exemptions for consolidated financial reporting. However, those exemptions are separate from and not automatically applied to sustainability reporting under the CSRD. As a result, an EU holding company or intermediate entity may be required to provide consolidated sustainability information under the CSRD even though it does not prepare financial information at that level. Practical challenges may arise in these cases as certain ESRS disclosure requirements leverage financial information, such as intensity metrics and disclosures under the EU taxonomy, discussed later in this audio companion. Absent clarifying guidance, our expectation is that a company in the scope of the CSRD will need to obtain the financial information required for its sustainability reporting. Additional reporting for a non-EU headquarter company. Even if the ultimate parent does not have debt or equity securities listed on EU regulated market, global consolidated reporting will be required beginning in fiscal year 2028, reporting in 2029 if, one, At least one entity in the consolidated group is within the scope of the CSRD or at least one EU branch generated net turnover revenue of more than 40 million euro in the preceding year, about 42 million US dollars as of September 30th, 2023, and consolidated net turnover revenue generated in the EU exceeds 150 million euro for each of the last two consecutive fiscal years about 159 million U.S. dollars as of September 30, 2023. The CSRD does not define branch for purposes of determining whether reporting is required at the global consolidated level, and there's no single definition that exists in other EU regulations or directives. In general, a branch would be economically independent from the parent company, for example, with its own payroll and accounting system, and, importantly, would be registered locally. In assessing whether this criterion is met, we recommend that companies perform an assessment based on existing relevant national definitions with advice from legal counsel. Additional clarification may also be provided when the CSRD is transposed into national law in the EU member states. That said, The assessment of whether a company has a branch is only relevant if the non-EU parent company does not have a subsidiary in scope of reporting. The CSRD states that the member states shall require the EU undertaking to, quote, publish and make accessible, end quote, the ultimate parent entity's sustainability report according to Directive 2022-2464, Article 40A, Paragraph 1. This global consolidated reporting would be in addition to the reporting requirements at an EU subsidiary or subgroup level. This reporting would be prepared in accordance with non-EU dedicated standards, which have not yet been issued by FRAG, as previously discussed, or ESRS, or, quote, equivalent standards, also as previously discussed. 
Question, how should a company determine its consolidated net turnover revenue? Answer, the CSRD does not specify how consolidated net turnover revenue should be calculated. We believe this is intended to cover net turnover as defined in the financial reporting framework of the company as a result of sales from the global consolidated group to customers in the EU. Other methodologies, however, such as net turnover recognized by sales from entities established in the EU, whether to customers in the EU or otherwise, may also be permitted. Until more details provided, companies should consider evaluating this criterion from multiple perspectives and prepare for implementation based on the methodology that yields the highest net turnover revenue generated in the EU. First-time application for certain NFRD reporters. Some EU member states expanded the scope of the NFRD during transposition into local law. Whether companies captured in the expanded scope will be included in the first round of CSRD reporters will be clarified as part of the EU member state transposition. Until there is clarity, we recommend that these companies prepare for filing fiscal year 2024 information in fiscal year 2025. Application date for first-time reporting. Determining when reporting will initially be required will depend on a company's facts and circumstances. Companies with securities listed on EU regulated market, that is, issuers, that have more than 500 employees will be among the first companies required to report. With reporting required beginning in fiscal year 2024, filed in fiscal year 2025. Other, quote, large undertakings, as well as parents of a, quote, large group, would generally have another year, followed later by all other companies in scope. Let's review first-time application dates for the categories of companies that will be required to report. This information is included in a table in the print publication found at viewpoint.pwc.com. First, for companies subject to the current NFRD requirements, which applies to public interest entities, which generally are large listed EU entities, banks, and insurance companies with more than 500 employees, plus quote issuers that, one, meet the definition of a large undertaking, and two, have more than 500 employees, first-time reporting will begin for fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2024. Next, for all other, quote, large undertakings and, quote, large groups in scope of the CSRD, first-time reporting will apply to fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2025. Next, for listed small and medium-sized undertakings, SMEs, first-time reporting will apply to fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2026, with an optional deferral of first-time application by two years. Small and medium-sized undertakings are defined separately as small undertaking and medium undertaking, but collectively these entities meet two of three criteria on two consecutive annual balance sheet dates. More than €350,000, but less than €20 million in total assets. More than €700,000, but less than €40 million in net turnover and an average of more than 10 employees, but less than 250 employees, according to Directive 2013-34, Article 3, Paragraphs 2 and 3. Next, for certain small and non-complex institutions and captive insurance undertakings as defined in EU regulation, first-time reporting will apply to the fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2026. Finally, for global consolidated level reporting for non-EU headquarter companies, first-time reporting will apply to fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2028. The appendix in the print publication includes examples of some of the more common structure and size scenarios and summarizes the related requirements and effective dates. Understanding whether a company may be required to report beginning in fiscal year 2024, 
filed in fiscal year 2025, is a critical first step for planning. These first-time application dates do not leave much time to develop the necessary processes and controls, even for companies that would not be required to report until fiscal year 2025 or later. Management Reports The management report requires a, quote, fair review of the development and performance of the company's business and of its position, together with a description of the principal risks and uncertainties that it faces, end quote. Similar to management's discussion and analysis in SEC filing or information included in the UK Strategic Report. Filing Requirements of the CSRD The CSRD requires sustainability reporting to be included in a dedicated section of the management report that's submitted based on the requirements of the relevant regulator and or EU member state. The management reports required to be filed together with the financial statements. The EU subsidiary or issuer that has the reporting obligation would be the entity required to publish the report in a digital format with sustainability reporting information tagged based on a digital taxonomy that will be developed. There are also specific reporting requirements for an EU subsidiary subject to CSRD that applies one of the reporting exemptions. Question. If a non-EU company is reporting at a global consolidated level, is it required to include the CSRD information as part of a management report equivalent? Answer. Although EU entities are required to include ESRS disclosures in their management report, the CSRD permits non-EU companies to provide the required disclosures as part of their, quote, consolidated sustainability reporting, end quote. We believe this exemption applies to both the required reporting for the consolidated entity, that is, beginning in fiscal year 2028, reporting in 2029, as well as any voluntary consolidated reporting to satisfy its subsidiary reporting requirements. Note, however, that it is not clear if a non-EU company listed on an EU regulated market would be able to satisfy its requirements through a sustainability report. These companies should perform additional analysis together with their legal counsel. A further question may arise, however, as to whether any reporting for purposes of CSRD should be included in other regulatory filings, for example, SEC Forms 10K, 8K, or 6K, or similar reporting in other jurisdictions. Specific to the SEC, we do not necessarily believe inclusion in SEC filings would be required based on review of the filing requirements of Form 8K and Form 6K, as well as the requirements for exhibits. Companies should also consider, however, Regulation SK Rule 12B20, which requires the disclosure of any information needed to make the required disclosures not misleading. We recommend that companies analyze the applicable regulatory requirements in consultation with legal counsel. Question. Which entity in the consolidated group is required to publish the Global Consolidated Sustainability Report beginning in 2029? Answer. The obligation to publish the Global Consolidated Sustainability Report for a non-EU headquarter company that is reporting under the €150 million criterion sits with the relevant EU subsidiaries or branches, not with the non-EU parent. In the event that required information is not provided, the subsidiary or branch would, quote, draw up, publish, and make accessible the sustainability report containing all information in its possession, obtained or acquired, and issue a statement indicating that the non-EU parent did not make the necessary information available. End quote. According to Directive 2022-2464, Article 40A, Paragraph 2. EU member states may inform the European Commission on an annual basis of the subsidiaries or branches of non-EU companies that fulfilled the publication requirement as well as instances when a report was published but includes a statement that not all necessary information was made available. The European Commission will publish a list of the non-EU companies that publish a sustainability report. Preparing to Report 
EU member states have until early July 2024 to transpose the requirements of the CSRD into national law. This timeline, however, does not mean that first-time application will be delayed from the current dates, which require adoption in 2024 for certain companies. Leading practice would be to evaluate current disclosures and identify significant gaps based on the most recently available draft standards. Reporting under the CSRD, adding to the complexity of preparing for adoption, the reason why a company is scoped into the CSRD will impact which of three types of reporting standards would need to be applied. European Sustainability Reporting Standards. As discussed later, 12 sector agnostic standards were adopted by the European Commission in July 2023 non-EU dedicated standards. These are dedicated standards to be applied at a global consolidated level as part of the additional reporting for non-EU headquartered companies. Simplified standards. These are for use by certain small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, small and non-complex institutions, and captive insurance undertakings as defined in EU regulation. Drafts of the simplified standards for both listed SMEs and voluntary reporting by SMEs were discussed in a September 2023 AFRAG Sustainability Reporting Board meeting. We expect these to be issued for public consultation in early 2024. The non-EU dedicated standards have yet to be developed and timing is uncertain. Sector standards are also in development and we expect there to be more than 40 sector-specific standards. That said, following a request from the European Commission in March 2023, EFREG shifted its focus to putting in place an ESRS implementation support function, prioritizing implementation guidance for the sector agnostic standards. In meetings in August and September 2023, EFREG discussed its draft implementation guidance related to the value chain and materiality assessment, which will be issued for public feedback before being finalized. More recently, in September 2023, Commissioner McGuinness noted that the European Commission's upcoming proposal to reduce the reporting burdens in the EU is expected to include a delay in the sector standards from the planned adoption date of 2024 to 2026. Question. How are the non-EU dedicated standards expected to differ from the European Sustainability Reporting Standards? Answer. Although the non-EU dedicated standards have not yet been issued for public consultation, the CSRD specifies certain requirements for those standards which provide some insight into their expected scope. Notably, the following requirements under the European Sustainability Reporting Standards would not be required under the non-EU dedicated standards. 1. The resilience of the group's business model and strategy in relation to risks related to sustainability matters. 2. The opportunities for the group related to sustainability matters. And finally, a description of the principal risks to the group related to sustainability matters, including the group's principal dependencies on those matters and how the group manages those risks. It may be tempting to wait for the non-EU dedicated standards. However, given the breadth of the potential disclosures and uncertainty around the timing of when drafts will be available, we advise companies not to delay but instead to begin their assessments now by referencing ESRS. Details of the European Sustainability Reporting Standards The 12 standards span all aspects of sustainability reporting, addressing environmental, social, and governance topics, and are intended to provide insight into a company's sustainability risks and opportunities, including its sustainability strategy, targets and progress, products and services, business relationships, incentive programs, and value chain. The standards are as follows. General standards. ESRS 1. General requirements. ESRS 2. General disclosures. Standards on environment. 
ESRS E1, climate change, ESRS E2, pollution, ESRS E3, water and marine resources, ESRS E4, biodiversity and ecosystems, ESRS E5, resource use and circular economy. Social standards, ESRS S1, own workforce, ESRS S2, workers in the value chain, ESRS S3, affected communities, ESRS S4, consumers and end users. Governance standards, ESRS G1, business conduct. The disclosures are interlinked with the company's discussion of its business model and strategy to assist stakeholders in assessing how the company fits into and contributes to society more broadly. Although companies may still be assessing the impact of CSRD and determining the scope of required reporting, now is also the time to delve into the ESRS. For example, understanding their structure delving into the details, and considering potential gaps between the requirements and current voluntary reporting as a critical step in developing an implementation plan. Easing the burden. The European Commission acknowledged the high level of effort required for many companies to prepare for and report under the requirements of the CSRD and ESRS. As a result, a number of transitional and voluntary provisions are included. For example, companies with 750 or fewer employees may omit Scope 3 GHG emissions disclosures in the first year of reporting. They may also omit reporting under ESRS E4, Biodiversity and Ecosystems, ESRS S2, Workers in the Value Chain, ESRS S3, Affected Communities, and ESRS S4, Consumers and End Users, for the first two years. A number of other transition provisions have been highlighted throughout this recording, including First, option to prepare sustainability reporting using, quote, artificial consolidation. Next, phased-in first-time reporting dates. Third, simplified reporting standards for listed SMEs. Fourth, three-year deferral of certain value chain-related disclosures. Certain disclosure requirements, including the Transition Plan for Biodiversity and Ecosystems, ESRS, E4, and information on non-employee workers and ESRS, S1, are voluntary. For a list of all phased-in disclosure requirements under ESRS, refer to Appendix C of ESRS 1, linked in the print publication at viewpoint.pwc.com. Structure and General Requirements of the ESRS The ESRS are structured based on the pillars of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, framework. As a result, some elements of the standards mirror the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards, as well as disclosures under the SEC Climate Proposal. The requirements in the two general or, quote, cross-cutting standards, that is, ESRS 1, General Requirements, and ESRS 2, General Disclosures, will apply across sectors and across all topical standards. ESRS 1 sets forth key concepts and definitions, including value chain reporting, time horizons, and double materiality that are foundational to this sustainability reporting. Required Disclosures Well, materiality is central to the determination of what information will be reported in the sustainability statements. ESRS 1 states that certain information under the ESRS would be required regardless of materiality. Specifically, all of the requirements under ESRS 2 and the disclosure requirements in the topical standards related to the process to identify and assess material impacts, risks, and opportunities. 
That said, if a company concludes that climate change is not a material topic and therefore does not report under ESRS E1 climate change, it must provide detailed disclosure of the conclusions of the related materiality assessment, including a forward-looking analysis of the conditions that could lead the company to conclude that climate change is material in the future. In addition, if a company omits information that derives from other EU legislation listed in ESRS 2 Appendix B, it must explicitly state that the information is, quote, not material. ESRS 2 includes required disclosures about the basis of preparation, as well as the four pillars of governance, strategy, impact, and opportunity management, including the materiality assessment process and metrics and targets. Additional requirements under the four pillars are included in the topical standards. The detailed requirements included in ESRS go well beyond the requirements in the new topical standard from the ISSB and the disclosures proposed by the SEC. And although ESRS may not require changes to existing practices, it's expected that companies will be motivated to change their behavior in lieu of providing disclosures that they're not taking actions or setting targets for sustainability impacts, risks, and opportunities that they have determined to be material. For example, ESRS E4, Biodiversity and Ecosystems, requires disclosure of targets related to biodiversity, including the established dates and milestones, and whether the targets are informed by and or aligned with relevant frameworks and regulation to achieve, quote, no net loss, quote, net gain, and, quote, full recovery, end quote. In response, a company may decide to make a public biodiversity commitment rather than disclose that it does not have one. Companies will need to develop the appropriate processes and controls to accumulate the high-quality data to support the disclosures. This may be particularly challenging in areas not previously covered by voluntary reporting, or if reporting will be required for the first time at a subconsolidation or subsidiary level. In addition, one notable difference with the ISSB and SEC proposals is with respect to the required organizational boundary. That is, the scope of entities included in the GHG disclosures. ESRS E1 would require companies to use the operational control approach. In contrast, the SEC proposal would require alignment with the financial statement, and the ISSB provides the flexibility allowed by the GHG protocol to use the control approach or the equity approach. These differences could result in different amounts disclosed under each framework. Climate Disclosure Requirements Although climate change is only one of five environmental standards in the ESRS, the provisions are a primary focus for many companies given the climate disclosure requirements in the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards and included in the SEC proposal. The climate disclosure requirements in ESRS E1 climate change are more robust than current voluntary reporting and would go beyond the requirements of the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards and the proposal from the SEC. For example, the SEC would require disclosure of a greenhouse gas, GHG emissions reduction target only if the company has made one. The ESRS, on the other hand, would require companies to disclose whether and how they have set GHG emissions reduction targets with further disclosure required if no such targets have been established. Selected Disclosure Requirements in ESRS E1 First, the resilience of the company's strategy and business model, including how scenario analysis was used to inform the identification of physical and transition risks and opportunities over the short, medium, and long term. Next, the company's policies and actions taken and planned for climate change mitigation, that is, limiting the increase in global average temperature as laid out in the Paris Agreement, and adaptation, 
adjusting to actual and expected climate change and its impacts. Whether and how the company established GHG emissions reduction targets with additional disclosure if no targets have been established, including whether such targets will be adopted and the time frame for their adoption or the reasons why the company does not plan to adopt such targets. Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions for the parent and consolidated subsidiaries, as well as for associates, joint ventures, accounted for under either the equity method or proportionally consolidated in the company's financial statements, unconsolidated subsidiaries, investment entities, and jointly controlled operations and assets over which the parent has operational control. Next, Scope 3 emissions in total for the parent and consolidated subsidiaries, as well as entities over which it has operational control, including significant Scope 3 categories. Scope 3 emissions would also include Scope 1, Scope 2, and Scope 3 emissions of associates, joint ventures, and unconsolidated subsidiaries in the parent's value chain over which it does not have operational control. Next. Other performance measures, including GHG emissions by monetary unit of net revenue, GHG intensity, for Scope 1, Scope 2, and Scope 3 emissions. Next, reconciliations of amounts used to calculate metrics to amounts included in the financial statements. And finally, anticipated financial effects for material, physical, and transition risks informed by the results of the scenario analysis used to conduct the resilience analysis and potential to pursue material climate-related opportunities. Even companies that currently report under the TCFT framework are likely to need to expand the nature and extent of their disclosures to comply with the proposed disclosures in the draft ESRS E1 given its detailed and explicit requirements. Certain of the disclosure requirements in the ESRS E1 are phased in, however, providing more time for these additional disclosures. Consideration of the value chain. The information reported would not be limited to a company's own operations, but would extend to, quote, direct and indirect business relationships in the upstream and or downstream value chain, according to draft ESRS 1 general requirements, Paragraph 67, page 15. These disclosures are expected to be some of the most challenging areas of reporting, given the scope and the reliance on information from parties not controlled by the company. The proposed disclosure requirements include key features of the value chain in the context of sustainability. For example, value chain disclosures would include the following. First, a description of where a company's material impacts risks, and opportunities are concentrated in its business model, own operations, and value chain. Details about value chain-related greenhouse gases removed from the atmosphere. A description of a company's policies that address the management of its material impacts, risks, and opportunities related to workers in the value chain. A description of the types of communities affected along the value chain. And finally, targets, time-bound and outcome-oriented related to reducing negative impacts on consumers and or end users. While disclosures related to the value chain may seem daunting, transitional provisions in the standards are intended to ease the burden of first-time reporting. For the first three years of reporting, if all of the necessary information is not available, companies can report on a comply or explain basis meaning that they would need to explain the reason for emitting any disclosures and their plans to obtain the needed information in the future. Further, during this time, companies would be able to limit value chain disclosures on policies, actions, and targets to information already available to the company or that is publicly available. Metrics would also exclude value chain information with certain exceptions, for example, Scope 3 disclosures. The interaction of this relief, however, with the relief provided for companies with 750 or fewer employees is unclear at this time. 
This election would provide companies with more time to develop a plan to gather the relevant information. Materiality Assessment The CSRD embraces double materiality, which requires that companies report information necessary to understand, first, the impact the company has on sustainability matters, including environmental, social, and employee matters, respect for human rights, anti-corruption, and bribery matters, and governance, an inside-out perspective, or, quote, impact materiality. And second, how sustainability matters affect a company's business development, performance, and position, also referred to as an outside-in perspective, or financial materiality. According to language in the CSRD, companies would need to consider each materiality perspective in its own right, and then disclose information necessary to understand how sustainability matters affect them, and information necessary to understand the impact they have on people and the environment. According to Directive 2022-2464, Paragraph 29. This means that a sustainability matter may be material from an impact perspective, a financial perspective, or both. Although these concepts of materiality differ, there may be overlap or linkages identified between these two perspectives. For example, if a company in agriculture depletes land and the biodiversity of a field, inside-out impact, This could directly affect the yield of the crops and, hence, the financial margin of the company. Outside-in effect, according to draft ESRS-1, general requirements, basis for conclusions, dated March 2023, paragraph BC62, page 18. ESRS-1, Appendix A, provides specific topics that, quote, shall, that is, must, be considered together with application guidance on how to perform the materiality assessment from both the impact and financial perspectives. It also includes guidance on identifying and assessing impacts, engaging with stakeholders, including those whose interests are affected or could be affected by the company's activities, and identifying risks and opportunities that affect or could reasonably be expected to affect the company's financial performance, position, or cash flows over the short, medium, or long term. This approach to materiality acknowledges the needs of stakeholders beyond investors and other capital providers and leverages definitions, steps, and concepts from the Global Reporting Initiative's approach to impact materiality. In contrast, the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Standards and the SEC's proposal retain the focus on what's material to investors consistent with how it's interpreted in current financial reporting. According to draft ESRS 1, quote, materiality assessment is informed by the dialogue with effective stakeholders. The undertaking may engage with effective stakeholders or the representatives, such as employees or trade unions, along with users of sustainability reporting and other experts to provide inputs or feedback on its conclusions regarding its materiality impacts, risks, and opportunities, end quote. EU Taxonomy Disclosures Companies in scope of the CSRD will also be in scope of Article 8 of the EU Taxonomy Regulation, according to Regulation 2020-852, of the European Parliament and the Council of June 18, 2020, on the establishment of a framework to facilitate sustainable investment and amending Regulation 2019-2088. The EU Taxonomy Regulation is a component of the European Commission's Action Plan Financing Sustainable Growth from March 2018, aimed to direct capital towards sustainable activities. Despite use of the term taxonomy, this taxonomy differs from the digital taxonomies used in financial reporting, such as IXBRL. The EU taxonomy provides a classification system for environmentally sustainable economic activities and requires disclosure of certain key performance indicators, KPIs, related to six environmental objectives representing the portion of activities that are sustainable. 
For non-financial companies, these KPIs relate to revenue, capital expenditure, and operating expenditure. KPIs required by financial companies will vary based on the type of company, but generally aim to provide information about the extent to which income or assets arise from sustainable activities. Companies reporting under the CSRD will be required to provide the EU taxonomy disclosures and KPIs together with the ESRS disclosures. This is, in part, to allow financial market participants, such as investment managers, to disclose information about the sustainability of their investment products, including whether they are aligned with the EU taxonomy. The technical requirements underlying the EU taxonomy are complex to assess and may be compounded by challenges in obtaining financial data required for reporting, particularly if consolidated financial information is typically not prepared for the reporting entity. Early analysis and discussion may prove useful in developing an approach. Requirement for third-party assurance The CSRD would include a mandatory assurance obligation for all reported sustainability information, including the disclosures required under the EU taxonomy regulation. In contrast, the SEC's proposed disclosures included in the financial statements would be within the scope of the financial statement audit, with additional attestation proposed only on the Scope 1 and Scope 2 greenhouse gas emissions disclosures for large accelerated and accelerated filers. Further, the level of assurance required over the IFRS sustainability disclosure standards will be established by each individual jurisdiction. The CSRD requirements begin with limited assurance and expand to reasonable assurance at a later date. This is a significant change from the current state as the audit requirement under the NFRD is limited to the, quote, existence of disclosures with no mandatory audit requirement over the content. Comparing reasonable versus limited assurance. Reasonable assurance will be familiar to users as the level of assurance provided in an audit of financial statements. A reasonable insurance engagement includes evaluating the design and implementation of relevant controls. It also includes obtaining an understanding sufficient to identify and assess risks of material misstatement, and provide a basis for designing and performing procedures to respond to the assessed risks. Limited assurance is also known as a review. It is a negative form of assurance that concludes as to whether any material modifications are needed for the information to be in accordance with specified criteria. The procedures performed are substantially less in extent than reasonable assurance, and include identifying and focusing on areas of increased risk that the information may be materially misstated. Although EU member states will initially determine which assurance standards may be used, such as International Standard on Assurance Engagements, ISAE 3000, or an equivalent national standard, the European Commission plans to adopt limited assurance standards by October 2026. The International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board is currently undertaking a project to develop international standards on sustainability assurance. An exposure draft was issued on August 2, 2023, and the comment period closes on December 1, 2023. Refer to the announcement linked in the print publication for more information. Reasonable assurance standards from the European Commission are expected to follow the limited assurance standards by October 2028, subsequent to completion of an assessment to determine if reasonable assurance is feasible for auditors and for companies. The CSRD specifies that a company's financial statement auditor would be able to provide assurance, but EU member states will decide during the transposition process whether companies may use another auditor or an independent assurance services provider. Use of others would be subject to appropriate accreditation as directed in the CSRD, as well as oversight and quality requirements equivalent to those in place for financial statement auditors. In addition, the audit committee would be expected to be responsible for sustainability reporting. Their responsibilities would include, for example, monitoring the sustainability reporting process and disclosing, quote, 
how the audit committee contributed to the integrity of sustainability reporting and what the role of the audit committee was in that process, end quote. According to Directive 2022-2464, paragraph 76. Finalization and clarification needed. Although the CSRD and sector agnostic ESRS are final, there remain a number of areas of uncertainty, including 1. The possibility of additional requirements by EU member states during the national law implementation process. Which sustainability reporting frameworks will be considered equivalent to ESRS? Next, how to calculate consolidated net turnover revenue generated in the EU. First time reporting date for those EU subsidiaries in scope of reporting under the NFRD because an EU member state's decision to expand the types of companies required to report. And finally, requirements of the non-EU dedicated standards. Focusing on what is known and developing an approach for what is unknown will allow companies to continue to progress until the requirements are finalized or guidance is provided. What's next? Deciding how to report. Once the initial scoping exercise is complete, the next critical decision is deciding the level of the organization at which to report. The decision to report at the individual entity level, the global consolidated parent, or something in between will have a profound impact on the nature and extent of resources needed for compliance. Although the specific provisions of CSRD may still change, As a result of the ongoing transposition of CSRD into national law, companies should start to prepare for the reporting obligations now. Evaluating scope, the applicable effective dates, alternatives for reporting at different levels within the organization, if any, and what compliance with the disclosure requirements will entail, including which sustainability matters are material and consideration of the EU taxonomy, will set the stage for successful implementation. These determinations may be thorny, and a company should assess the need for early involvement of its legal team. Staying close to decisions made by the EU member states over the 18-month transposition period also will be critical as decisions are made and the requirements evolve. The ESRS set forth a wide range of requirements and should not be underestimated in terms of their complexities. Although the final reporting standards include a number of transitional reliefs to ease the reporting burden for companies, the level of effort required remains high. Obtaining an understanding of the wide-ranging disclosure requirements, as well as the expected effort to obtain information and develop and implement reporting systems is an important first step in creating an implementation plan. In addition, this understanding may provide insights that support decisions about the level at which to prepare this reporting when multiple entities within the organization are impacted. While this could be viewed as a compliance exercise, the CSRD is about more than just mandating sustainability disclosures. It's aimed at driving behavioral change. Companies have the opportunity to reframe the narrative of their purpose and business model in the context of sustainability and to seek opportunities for value creation. It will be a journey, but companies can position themselves for success through active engagement. That does it for our In The Loop audio companion. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out the print version available at viewpoint.pwc.com where you'll find an appendix of examples of common structures and size scenarios with related reporting requirements along with other PwC resources. Our publications, common letters, and podcasts offer additional information and insight into the CSRD, as well as the other major sustainability reporting proposals. So that you never miss any of our audio content, follow the PwC Accounting Podcast series wherever you listen to your podcasts. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. 
please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.